I want to talk about the 29th operation of faith, which is faith follows. Now I'm going to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13, verse 7. Remembering those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Notice that. The Bible says, whose faith follow. Now I want you to notice here, the Bible says, we should follow <clears throat> those who rule over us. When the Bible is talking about those who rule over us, he's talking about shepherd of our lives. Now, there are people that God has given unto us as men and women of God. They are our leaders. Some of them, the apostles, some of them, are their prophets, evangelists, evangelist, pastors, teachers, or they can just be a home cell leader, someone we submit ourselves under. The Bible says these leaders, we must follow their faith. We must follow their examples. We must allow their lives to inspire us as we begin to walk with God. You notice, when you gave your life to Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body. In other words, He placed you somewhere. And wherever the Holy Spirit placed you in that particular place, a church or organization, wherever you, you are positioned, there is a leader there, overseer there. There is someone in charge there. So now the Bible is telling us that particular person that you find there, you have to look at their lives, allow their lives to have an impact on you, learn what they are doing, take steps behind them, and as you begin to take the, the step behind them, you also going to grow in faith. And when you begin to grow in faith, your faith now begins to produce a result. And this is one of the ways ways you operate in faith. And the reason why we have to follow the leader or the person that God placed over us, the word here they use, the word rule. It's not really ruling in terms of control, no. Uh, there's no control like we were saying last time in the kingdom of God, but we inspire people to follow us. But when you're talking about rulership, you're talking about uh, leadership, those who are in charge, in regard to our faith or in our walk with God. And the main reason why we have to follow them is because, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that will be unprofitable to you. Notice the Bible says that those people that God has placed over us, who are ruling over us, or who are leading us, the Bible says we, they will give an account to, for our souls. Now, the reason we want to follow their faith, first of all, is because it is God who chose them. And if the Bible says they watch over your soul, it means that God knows them. It means that it is God who placed them in that particular position, that particular environment, so they can look after our souls. Now, the Bible says, as they are looking after our souls, they are going to give an account to God. So, for them now to look after our souls, for them now to be known by God, for them now to be able to stand before God, and being known by God, it means that these people have faith in God. Because, like we said again last, last week, Hebrews eleven six, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if these people, they could not please God, God could have never put souls under them. The reason that God has assigned them men and women, so they can lead them, is because these men and women, somehow, they have faith in God, 
somehow they are led by the Spirit of God. That's why God has placed them in the particular place because souls are very precious to God. And on top of that, remember the Bible says they are going to give an account to God for their souls, for our souls. And this read what I always say to, you know, today you find people want to be leaders. They want to be, uh, they want to lead churches and things like that. But you need to understand that when you are leading people as a Christian leader, one day you are, you're going to stand before Jesus and give an account for that particular soul. And I always wonder, God, this is the hardest thing. I mean, you can't compare this with any job. There is no boss. After death, when I go and give an account for your soul, pastors, when I give account for the souls of people they are leading. And that we have really, if God has not called you, don't even venture into it. Make sure that God has called you and you should be a good shepherd. Because the Bible says a good shepherd, in this particular case here, if God has sent people under you, he will give his life for the sheep. That's a good shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd and assigned us also a shepherd. So you must be prepared, watch this, to die for the people that you are leading. Just like David, when the lion attacked the sheep, his father's sheep, he didn't see, they didn't run away, so my God, he attacked the lion. He could have lost his life, he could have been killed. If there was a wolf or any kind of beast who attacked the sheep, because there is father's sheep, he will, he will attack back. The same with you when you are a Christian leader. God will give you sheep. That's your, these are your father's sheep. They are not your sheep. They are your father's sheep. So you have to be prepared to attack the lion. The Bible says the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So you must be prepared to put your life online. And... Uh, what he said is not really what we are seeing today, but that's what God is expecting from us. So I want us to understand, people of God, when God has placed us under leadership, God has put leader before us, God wants us to follow their faith, to follow their examples. So we take steps behind them, we see how they are doing it, so that we are able also to initiate ourselves with those steps, so we can be able to pray, to produce fruit in regard to our faith. Now, let's go to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 as we begin to build on this. At 1 verse 9. That which has been is what will be. That which is done in, is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Glory to God. The Bible says, for us... For you and me, living on this earth here, there is nothing new. He said that which was, it is what it is today. And that what is today, day, it is what will be. So, as far as God is concerned, human really, we are just in this cycle of uh, repeat. Cycle of the same and the same thing over and over. Because the things of the past... Uh, what we are doing today, and I think we are, uh, we're going to do tomorrow is what we, we're going to be doing today. I mean, it's just the same thing over and over. That's why you find a young person can be 20, he looks at the old man, he's 70, 70 75, he thinks, ah, that old man. But they forget that that young, that old man was also 20. He's even a better place because now he has lived this 20, he has passed those, uh, that level. And then he's looking at the young man. And uh, sometimes we think, uh, you know, young men, they, they think they are trendy. You know, they cut their hair a certain way. And ladies cut their hair, you know, make their hair a certain way. And young men dress a certain way. But if you ask oh, the man who was 80 or 90, they also had their trends or their style in their days. So it's pretty much the same thing coming back and forth. There is nothing new under the sun. I mean, everything is just what has been. Glory to God. So, you know, the, the that's why when it's very important we speak to old people. You know, no, old people have been there before us. They will tell you, I mean, pretty much, 
there's there's no there's nothing new so if you if let, let's talk about cars for instance let's just look something simple even though they make a car that car can have five engine or it can drive with electricity or drive with water it does not matter it's just gonna be a car you're gonna drive it on the road it's not like you have you're gonna have wings you start flying going speaking in tongues no it's just a car <laughs> so people maybe many many years ago they drove cars that were different but it was just a car so if you want to dress you no know, we might say oh, but no these people and the old people used to dress this kind of clothes we are dressing but it's just a clothes you are not you are not going to put it in your mouth or you're gonna just dress it just everybody just that's how they dressed thousand years ago that's why you're gonna to dress today nothing really is new it's just that we packaging is different times are different but you know it's just so it's the same old, same thing over and over. Glory to God. But when we say there's nothing new under the sun, but yet there is always the first time for everything. Think about this. There was a first time for you to ride a bicycle. Now you're going to drive a bicycle today. It's easy for you, but there was always... A first time. There's a first time for you to drive a car. Now today you don't even think about it. you enter the car you just drive. But there was a first time you went through the sweaty hands, butterfly in your stomach. When you get you you get on the highway, you are thinking, oh my God, that truck gonna hit me. You had all these kind of. There was always a first time. It does not matter if you are self-taught like some of us who just. Nobody really taught you, just drove, you know. But either way, it just, there was a first time for everything. There's a first time, you know, when it comes to education, it was the first day you went to school. Regardless of your, you know, education system, either kinder or primary, but there's a first time. You went to school for the first time, you, you're exposed to this strange environment without your parents. There's always a first time for everything. But the first time to to be a mother, you know, uh, the first time, the first time you might now you might have five, six, seven children, but there was a time you did not have any, and there was a first time you had your first baby. There's always a first time. The same with the man. It's the first time you became a father, or the first time you became a husband, the first time you became a wife. There's always a first time for everything. It's the first time you you got your degree, first time you got your certificate, diploma, first time you became a pastor. I mean, there is always that. Like, there is so the point of making this: there is nothing new under the sun. But when it comes to our personal experiences, there is always the first time for everything. There was the first time you ever put on clothes. You're born naked. So there's always the first time your mom wrapped you up and dressed you. So there's always the first time for everything. Now, however, what you call first time, you are not the first to do it. What is first to you is someone else's history. When you get married today, that's your first time to get married. But you are not the first one to get married. There's always someone who got married before you. When you, you, you get your degree today, this is your first time to get a degree. But you are not the first one to get a degree. Degree. There are people who got degrees before you. You we anoint you with oil today, become a pastor. Yes, this, this is your first time to be a pastor, but you are not the per first person to be a pastor. Yes, there's a first time for you, but you're not the first one to do what you are doing. So, what am I saying? What is true with life? That's why you find in the world they have consultants. 
consult, consult, consultant are people who either they have studied the subject for a long time, they have experience on the subject, so you want to start your business. You go ahead, I remember I started a business a while ago, those days uh, during the, the, the child care boom. I also had uh, the agency. I started an agency, so I had to get a consultant. You pay that consultant, so he's the one who to tell you, do this, you do that. Why? Because the consultant understand the law, he understand, he understand business, he has connection, he knows what to say, he knows what to do, he understand it. Why? He has been there. Either he studied the, 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 the subject or some uh, some consultant, they've retired or they've, they're running the business in that field. Whatever is the case. So in the world, we have consultant in businesses, in sport, in, in all sorts of things. Even in politics, you find we have what we call the lobbyists. The lobbyists that are there to lobby on your behalf. Because when you become a politician, especially a young politician, you don't know much. Because politics is, is, a, is a world of deals. People make a lot, of, a lot of deals there and stuff. So when you have people are lobbying for you, they know which door to knock at, who to connect you with. and So they can give you a vote. They can give you advantage. You can be voted into office and all sorts of things. You know, so there's always someone who knows something on that particular subject or someone who's ahead of you. That's why you find even kings, even kings of the earth or president, they have counselors, they have advisors, they have cabinet, you know, and our prime minister, he's going to have an advice in his cabinet, they have someone to advise him uh, on security matter, on co economic matter, social, whatever. They, they don't just take a decision. Media, uh, they have the media. Uh, uh, experts who come talk to them. No, today when I talk about this, they understand what's happening in, a, in, in the country, the community. They are connected to a lot of things. They come tell you, no, don't try to say this. No. Everything we see that is real, is prepared, is, is well informed. The politicians, political politicians, they don't just do things, it can cost them. So they have to. So, what I'm trying to say, there are always someone who went ahead of you in any field. So, what is true with life in general is also true in faith. There is nothing new in the sun, under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. So when you gave your love to Jesus, you already found some people who were there before you. These people, they can inspire you. These people can challenge you. These people can, can help you avoid certain mistakes these people can help you save a lot of time you know uh, I was, when i was thinking about this today i said to myself if oh, there's no regret we know everything has a purpose but if god would give me let's say bring me 20 years back or 30 years back i know i'm going to do certain things differently why because either you did it yourself you know any better no one was ahead of you you just went try and error you made mistakes but you learned you see, so you when God put, uh, put people ahead of us, we have to learn from them, train by them, be inspired by them, emulate what they do, and also implement that in our lives. Now, someone can say, but I can't be inspired by that man. I can't be inspired by that woman because she made mistakes and... Uh, you know, when it comes to learning, you, you can learn both ways. If someone failed in a particular area in their lives, what you learn from them is what not to do. You say, I they fail, so I'm not going to do this, otherwise I'll fail like they did. So what happened now? They fell. Instead of you disconnecting yourself because oh, they failed in this area, you know, you learn what not to do. You can even learn from the devil, you know. The devil fell in heaven. What do you learn? Don't mess up with God. I mean, so you also can learn from someone who has succeeded in what to do uh, in particular area in our lives. So now the Bible says these people, these leaders that God has put before us or we are under them 
we need to follow the example of their faith. And not, not what the Bible says, considering the outcome of their conduct. So the Bible says, yes, we need to follow the leader. Yes, to be submitted. But the Bible also encourages us not to be blind followers. Look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So Apostle Paul is telling us, okay, I'm following Christ. And you imitate me as I follow Christ. So if Apostle Paul, he, he, he conditions the fellowship, he conditions his ability to lead others in his connection to himself and commitment to follow Jesus. So if you have a leader who is no longer following Jesus, is, is control, compromising, contradicting himself as far as the word is concerned, is not living under the word of the Lord anymore. That particular leader will love them but they have disqualified themselves from our fellowship. Because the Bible here is very clear that we must follow them as they follow Christ. We must imitate them if they imitate Christ. So if they don't no longer imitate Christ, we no longer follow them. That's why when it comes to following leaders, we should never be following after the flesh. Remember Apostle Paul, what he said in Philippians, I believe 3 verse 3, he said we are the circumcision who worship God in his circumcision, worship God in his spirit, and put no confidence in the flesh. So if we really want to follow a man or a woman of God that God has placed before us, we must always have the spirit of discernment. It means that we must begin to discern what is really driving the leader. Is it self-ambition? Is it God passion? Is it the kingdom agenda or their own personal agenda? That's why you see the Bible who really teaches us to have what? Discerning of spirit. We must be able to discern. Otherwise, we can be pursuing some, we can be imitating someone who just Building his own empire, building his own kingdom instead of be, uh, building the kingdom of God. Remember what we studied last time, um, sometime in the past. Peter came to Jesus. He said to Jesus, you are the son of God. Jesus said, ah, Peter, well done. Flesh and blood did not tell you my father was in heaven. Few verse, just a few verse after that, Jesus told Peter, I'm going to die and I'm going to suffer. Peter said, no, no, you're going to die. Jesus looked at Peter and said, get it behind me, Satan. You see, Jesus was not condemning Peter. He was not just being driven by Peter because Peter said it. He was right the first time. Jesus could have said, no, he was right. He must be right. No, you can be right one minute and wrong the second minute. So, because there's a fine line in, in the realm of the spirit, you never know when someone has missed it already. They are doing their own thing and you are following someone being really being deceived by the devil. So, we have to be really careful that we have the spirit of discernment. Notice the Bible says, the Bible teaches us about the spirit of discernment. It is the spirit of discernment. It is not the spirit of uh, discerning of men. Because some people, they want to discern, oh, I want to look, if no, you are not looking to people. You are not discerning men. You are discerning the spirit behind them. Because when you start discerning men, that is what we call suspicion. You, being suspe you are suspecting people. That's not right. That really is based on the flesh. Probably it's your own insecurity, fear, you know, just your, it's, it has to do with you. It has nothing to do with God. But when it comes to following people, uh, it's no suspicion. Is actually discernment. You discern the spirit. You discern what is behind a person. As we follow. So that we are not just blind leaders, blind followers. Because the Bible says if a blind leaders lead blind people, we all fall in the ditch. So we don't want to do that. Glory to God. But what I want us to know these people of God though, as you begin to work with people, you realize some people say, no, me, I don't I don't believe in following men and women. I just believe in 
following the anointing. And some people they use this scripture. Look at this first John chapter 2, verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So some people, they use their scripture and say, no, the Bible says, you know, the anointing is me. I don't need anybody to teach me. Because I already have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, before I address that, that issue, let me just say, talk a little bit about anointing. Anointing is a very uh, vast uh, subject that you really... Um, by the grace of God, one day we have to give it attention so we can look at it. It's so uh, big. But just in passing, when we talk about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it's actually the person is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who has the anointing. The person is the Holy Spirit. But the anointing is his operation. For instance, you come to church, someone healing the sick. What is using, what the healing you are saying, that's the anointing that brings the healing. But the person who's bringing it is the Holy Spirit. So the operation is the anointing. The person is, a, is, a, is the Holy Spirit. The operation or the activity that you are seeing, people are falling, demons are mad. That's the anointing doing all that. But the person who's doing that is the, the Holy Spirit. Now, when a person has the anointing, now, that's a saying that I say like we have to really take it one day just to talk about that. When a person has the anointing, that person becomes a dangerous person. That's why you find in the Old Testament, you could be a great warrior, you can be a great man, but if there is no anointing or a place over your head, you could never lead the people of God. So the anointing of God is the qualifier for kingdom service. In the Old Testament, you see they put the anointing upon, upon a person. That person now is set aside. That person now, when you touch him, when the Bible says, touch no my anointing, my anointed, when you touch that particular person, you have to touch God. And that is true. With all of us, all of us, we are anointed, so we have to be careful how we deal with one another. Because remember, the purpose of the anointing is to remove the burden and to destroy yokes. So a burden is not only a sickness, a disease, a financial crisis. Someone can become a burden. So if you are becoming a burden or a yoke or a problem to your brother or a sister, if you, you, you don't have a problem, they don't have to fight you. The anointing over them, it will... It will remove you. It will remove a, you as a burden. It's going to destroy you. It will remove the burden, destroy yours. So, when you, not only the, the human being, if, for instance, we take, you take your house, you say, okay, I give this house to God, and we pray over that house, that house is no longer. Your house become a house of God. So whoever abuses the house abuses God. That's why you see Nebuchadnezzar when he took the he took utensils, he took the cups and the, the spoon and what have you from the temple. He was drinking in it. So those utensils, they might have been just cups, no more cups like any other cup. But when they, they dedicate them, they consecrate them, it became anointed cups. So when the king started drinking out of this cup, he was drinking out of God's cup. Now remember, God does not share his cup with anybody. He doesn't share his glory with anybody. So up and now, it became God's ravel. And then, you know, the finger, man, and man, and take care of fresh him. I mean, he didn't wait. So God punished him. Why? Because he touched on something that anointed. So I want us to understand people, God, really want to talk about anointing. Anointing. Is actually the that the the activity is 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 the person is is, is a, a, the the Holy Spirit the operation the anointing and what the anointing now comes over a person's life it's actually it's actually divine ability the anointing will give you wisdom in the area of your anointing meaning if God has anointed you to lead a church 
You might not know what to do, but that anointing, the Bible said, will teach you. Or it's going to lead you to a place you have to be taught. You my God has given you uh, a wife. You are a husband. And the husband, you are the priest of home. You might say, but me, I don't know how to be a priest in my home. The anointing, because you are the head, it comes with anointing. That anointing will teach you. The same with if a mother. Or, so the anointing is not only for pastors, not only for ministry. You, can, you need anointing as a mother, especially nowadays, today. You know, children are just all over the place. That anointing will give you wisdom sometimes to know what you want. your children are watching. You might not know what they are watching, but the Holy Spirit will tell you, no, you need to check this and check that. Go to their bags, the one they are not there, whatever is the case. The anointing is able to teach you. So, there are two kinds of anointing. Let, let me just, as I'm, I'm on already this one. There's what we call the anointing upon. So, when a person is anointed, now the anointing, as I remember, is the ability of God that comes upon a person when you receive the anointing. It comes by the Holy Spirit. There's anointing upon, upon you. So when the anointing is upon you, that anointing is for service, is for the assignment. Whatever God has called you, there's an anointing upon you to do that, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to, to work miracles, to, to teach the word, to, to prophesy, to, to pastor, whatever, to be an apostolic prophet, whatever God has called you, that's what we call the anointing upon. And a lot of people love this anointing because this anointing, what? Wow, the people. It wows people. Oh my God. It, it creates visibilities. People clap for you and people, you know, all sorts of things. That's the anointing uh, uh, upon. What, what you see people do, raise the dead. My God, you can prophesy. That's what we call the anointing upon them. That is not the anointing you live with. There's another anointing we call the anointing within. That anointing within is the anointing that we live with. The anointing that teaches you holiness, the fear of God, self-control, is the anointing within. Now the problem is this. Someone can be operating just under the anointing upon him. He's raising the dead. He's prophesying, perform miracle. He's fornicating sleeping with women, sleeping with men, lying, cheating, extortioning people's money, all sorts of things. So people don't understand the anointing works. They say, oh, he's a man of God. God wouldn't be doing. No, 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 no. Remember Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. The calling, the gift and the calling are irrevocable. So when God puts anointing over you, he puts you over you. He's not going to take it away because you slept with a woman. I remember I heard a story of a, a, one man who was saying, you know, he's, he's a prophet. He said, me before I profess properly, I need to take at least two or three uh, beer, a bottle of beer. And when I feel my head like that, that man can profess you out of town. Can call your name, your mother, tell you stuff. So, you see, this man, yes, he has anointing. It's not like this beer that brings the anointing, no. He has a problem with alcohol. Because the anointing is upon him, he can use it anytime. I have an anointing of glory over my life. If I want things to manifest, I don't have to pray. God is upon my life. I remember even in South Africa, what God told me. He said to me, this one I've given is a gift. It's been little, little things manifesting. It's like asking think God. I used to think God is like magic, you know. He said, it is over you. So when God put that, you, that's why you need to understand. What is the anointing that is upon you? If you have an anointing of teaching, you can work. If God called you to teach the word, you have that anointing. You can wake up today and say, okay, you are teaching on love. You might not prepare. Of course, your ideas might not be uh, uh, orderly because of you did not prepare. But you can teach. Why? Because the anointing upon. Now, people now, they use that anointing to, to impress people, use that anointing. But what God is looking for is not the anointing upon, the anointing within. It is that anointing within us that conforms us into the image of Christ, that changes us, that not only that you, you, you are healing the sick, you heal the sick, but you walk in humility. You prophesy, but you're a man of integrity, a woman of integrity. You, you, you operate in apostolic, but you are humble. I mean, you'll find here, we see the, the, the manifestation, we see what the Holy Spirit is doing, but we also see the character of Christ. So that's the, just one thing in passing. So we'll go back to our scripture, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. People say, you know what? 
Nobody should teach me. The Bible said the anointing will teach me everything. Now, let's let look at this. In John chapter 14, verse 26, By the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Notice that. The, the, Jesus said he will send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is a teacher. Which means the Holy Spirit is going to teach through men and women. The Holy Spirit resides in people. So when the Bible says we have the anointing of God, we don't need anybody to teach us. It doesn't mean that you don't need any brother, any sister to help you in any area of life. No. What is telling us, when people are teaching us, or people are instructing us, or people are leading us in general, they should do it under the leadership and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They should never use their own personal experiences, their education, their training, even their own personal counter. You know that personal counters are no basis for theology. If someone went to heaven, it's good. And it's biblical. Apostle Paul went to heaven, you know, said to heaven, if someone died, came. You can't use your personal experience. You make that a doctrine. And people say, no. Your personal experience is never basis for any doctrine, never basis for any teaching. I mean, you can use that as an example. You might say, well, no, God used me, I went to heaven. But that is no ba a ba a basis for teaching. The, the, our basis for teaching is the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So when God now, he tells us that we don't need people to teach us, it does not mean that we, you don't need anybody. You need men and women who who are under the leadership of the, the Holy Spirit, and are operating also under both anointing. You can see they are doing it with God. You can also see that in their character. So I want us to understand that we have people, because the Holy Spirit lives in people anyway. You know, he lives uh, in you, he lives in me. So they are gifting you that God wants me to benefit. And that's what, even the, the deception of people who, they are just depending on the anointing upon them. They don't care about the anointing within me. They don't care about character. They don't depend on the Holy Spirit to, to change their lives. Because when God anoints you, He does not anoint you for you. He anoints you for somebody else. That's why you wonder sometimes, how can He die? This man had a gift of healing. The gift of healing is not for him. It's for somebody else. And because God loves His people, you can see someone acting crazy. God is still using him for the sake of the people. But that one is a vessel God is going to destroy and God is going to judge. So we need to understand that the Holy Spirit, he gives gift. Right. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he himself, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Notice the Bible says when Jesus ascended to heaven. He made some to, to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers, some to be all that. So when he went to heaven, he gave us gifts. So the gift that Jesus gave to us a human being. The gift of Christ, a human being, that we call the four, the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. These are gifts that God gave to us. So I'm a gift to you. Now, as we're going to study later, whatever you receive from the gift is up to you. So among the gift that Jesus gave to us as a human being, we also have the gift of a teacher. Remember, I have the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, and the teacher. Jesus could have never given us a teacher if he knew we don't need teaching from anybody. I mean, we have the whole office, the office of a teacher. In fact, for any revival to take place, we need the initiation of teaching. Why? Because the Bible says, I believe uh, that scripture we read, we read most of the time, I believe in Job chapter 2, 
where the Bible says, I put my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and daughters prophesy. Most of the time, we just start from verse, I think, 28. But if you go up there, you notice the Bible says, And my people shall no longer be in confusion, and I shall pour out my spirit. So the prerequisite or the condition for the outpouring of the spirit of God is eradication of confusion. And who, er who eradicates co uh, confusion in the body of Christ? Is are the teachers. The teachers, you can see their small finger in the... They are the ones who bring balance. So when the, the church is taught, there's clarity. That's why we take time to, to teach like this. When clarity comes, when understanding revelation comes, the things begin to happen. Because people are doing things based on a pattern. Because the Bible says, Psalm 127, unless the Lord build the house, the labor in vain will build it. So how do you build? You build according to the pattern, meaning the way God has already designed things. So when we are building according to the way God has already designed things, what's going to happen? God begins to manifest himself. You don't even cry out. You don't even have to pray. And I think I said this the last time. When you read the last, the last uh, uh, chapter of the last verse of the book of Exodus, the Bible says, And the glory of God descended. Moses did not pray. They did not fast, nothing like that. Why did the, the glory of God descend? Because the Bible says, if you read, I think, Exodus 25, 26 there, God said to Moses, build according to pattern that I show you. Meaning you build according to the way I show you. So when now Moses finished building the way God showed him, God came down. So that's why we need teachers in the body of Christ. So when the Bible said, we, we, you don't need him to teach you, it does not mean that you're arrogant, then nobody's going to teach me, No. It means that we need teachers who are under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and we have them in the body of Christ today. Glory to God. Now you notice, we have the gift of Christ. These are human beings. I'm a gift. I'm an apostle. I'm a gift to the body of Christ. I'm a gift to the body of Christ. We also have the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of Christ are human beings. I'm emphasizing this. You have to know this. The gift of Christ are human beings. I'm apostle, some are prophets, some are pastors. We are human beings. We are a gift given to the body of Christ. So me, my, I'm not limited as an apostle just to be in a local church. No. An apostle is part of the body. We are governmental offices. We, are, we can be, we go to open portals, places where but the kingdom operates. So, but the Holy Spirit now, the gift of the Holy Spirit are no body, are the gift. We know, for instance, in First uh, Corinthians chapter 12, I'll read it very quickly. I don't, I don't want to read the whole thing. You just read it when you are, you are free at home. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11. The Bible talks about the gift of the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, uh, the gift of working on miracle, prophecy, discerning of spirit, different kind of tongues. The interpretation of tongues. So all these are what they are gift of the Spirit. You don't see them, people operate in them. These are the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's your operating on the anointing. But the gift that Christ gave to us, the human being. But all these gifts are in, in people. So when you are rejecting people, I don't believe in this sister, I don't believe in brother, what is he going to tell me about? You are missing what God can bring to you. Remember what I told us one day, everything you are looking for is either in you or around you. Therefore, humility is a prerequisite for kingdom manifestations. It means this. If I'm looking to uh, something, if I pray in tongues, I'm quiet, it can bubble up. God can give me ideas. I can know what to do. But if I don't have it, I'm, I'm failing. I have to look around me. I have to look, but Patrick, can you do the sound? Can you do the... You'll find out People around me. So what I'm trying to say, either it is in you. God can give you an idea, but people are going to carry the idea they are around you. So you need to be sensitive. And you must give people a chance. You know, Moses, he received uh, the vision of the tabernacle. He didn't build it. The guys like all oh, this guy, what, what do you call them? All these uh, young men, they are the one God put his spirit upon them and they did the work. So everything you are looking for is either in you and around you. So remember, people can teach you. So when we are talking about uh, uh, faith uh, follows, we follow men and women that God has put in our lives. Now, when I want us to look at two examples in the life of people, really, that they, are, they needed help. 
from other men. I want to look at the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Act, Act chapter 8, page 21 to 31. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this, the chariot. So Philip ran to him. I heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? He said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, I think I said this once. I told us, I preached a message on the scripture. I, for some reason, I've never forgotten that message. In 1995, disappointed in a place of expectation. This man came from Jerusalem. I remember there was a revival during that particular time, just outpouring of the Holy Spirit and great things were happening. This guy came from Jerusalem, where the apostles were. The temple was there. Everything was there. Now, you will think you'll get the Holy Spirit, you get revelation there, you understand all the mystery there. But this guy now is, is, is riding back because he is from Ethiopia, going back to his country, is reading the book of Isaiah, he's reading aloud, he say, okay, he was taken like a sheep to the slaughter, and this and that. So, Philip was somewhere else, was just walking. And the Holy Spirit said to him, he said, I want you to overtake the chariot. He overtook the chariot. He heard this man reading the book of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit, Philip asked the, 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 the guy, do you understand what you are reading? The man said, how can I understand? Someone explain me. Wait a minute. The Holy Spirit knew because he's the one who spoke to Philip. Why didn't the Holy Spirit just open his eyes supernatural? Now he got it. On top of that, the guy came from Jerusalem. Why didn't he empower him from there, get a gift of word of knowledge, revelation, so just understand the scripture? But God put someone on his way. And he was on the chariot. And this, I'm going to talk about it again later on. Because sometimes you can disqualify yourself from receiving from a person because you're in a better place than them. Because this guy can say, what would this man tell me? He says, he's walking me, I'm in a chariot. You know? So, he came explaining. So, it was Philip now who ushered him into the place of understanding. Philip taught him, explained him. And if you read the Bible, the Bible says he, he baptized him and he vanished. You know, this is just in passing. There are certain times, as we walk with God, there are certain people, they'll come in your life for a season. And there will be a, tem a temptation sometimes if you're a leader, a special leader. Everyone you want to come in your life, you just want to hold them. Let's start the church. Now, some people are just going to come for a season. You impact them. You will notice their impact probably 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And some of them you will never know until you go to heaven. God will tell you this reward is for this. And I say, God, what did I do? He well, you pray for someone. Really? Yeah, you pray. Because God, remember the Bible says, God is not unrighteous to for forget. Hebrews chapter 6, I think, 10. God is not unrighteous to forget. It means that it is unrighteousness to forget. When someone does good thing to you, someone was a blessing to you, you can't go start running your mouth, this person, it, it is it's actually is a, is a wickedness, is evil. So, here is the Philip, it was a blessing to this particular man. And this man understood, the Bible says, he went his way rejoicing. So the point I'm trying to make there. God used a human being to be a blessing to another person. Just to tell you that God uses people. So when God is telling us we should follow the example, I'm checking the time, the, the example of people have put the, uh, in front of us because we have the Holy Spirit. People have the Holy Spirit and they can lead us in a place of significance. Now look at this, the life of Paul. In the book of Acts, I believe, chapter 9, verse uh, 5 to 6. And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord say, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gods. So he, trembling and extorting, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Wait a minute. I met with Jesus face to face. And I would think like, you know, the ultimate pursuit and purpose of every man is to meet with Jesus. And some of us think that if I just meet with Jesus, I'm just going to be fine. Well, here's the man. He met with Jesus face to face. Then he said to him, no, I want you to go to the city 
you find a man who is Ananias, who will tell you what to do. Me, I'm wondering, what is that Ananias that can tell me that God, Jesus wouldn't tell me? As there are certain people are so arrogant, they think, no, nobody can teach them. No, I talk with Jesus. Listen, Apostle Paul taught with Jesus, but was sent to Ananias. And we, if you read after that, do, have you ever heard of Ananias? Whoever after that, nobody knows when, where you went to. I mean, it was just a season in his life. So there are people God will put you away because God uses people. God trusts people. You might have problem with people. You might say, but they did this, they did that. Listen, get over it. God uses people. Men and women, like my son preached one day, they are carriers. They are carriers. They carry the Holy Ghost within them. Glory to God. Now, I want to finish with this. This is a counsel. I've got five minutes to go. An advice I want to give to you as I'm concluding. Are all the men of God perfect? Are all the women of God perfect? No. I'm the first one. I lift my two hands and my two toes, meaning I'm far from perfection. Nobody's perfect, but God uses us anyway. I love this second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. It says this. Hmm. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. And I wanted to read it in an easy translation so we can understand properly. God has given to us the gift to speak his message. But we ourselves are very weak. It is like we are keeping his valuable gift in a clay pot. So it is clear that the, the great power of God message come from him, God himself and does not come from us. Apostle Paul said, yeah, we carry the excellence of uh, the, the treasure of God. We carry the things of God. We carry the anointing of God. But this anointing of God is in an earthen vessel. Earthen vessels mean that it is in a clay. Now remember, clay is limited, is dirty, is can be broken, it has flow. But that does not disqualify the glory for remaining in the clay. I want you to understand, people, God, from the beginning of the world, God has never used a, a, a perfect vessel. If you are looking for one, you will never find one because you won't be one either. The only perfect vessel that Jesus ever, God ever used, it was Jesus Himself. All of us. Like I said the other day, we must be wearing a t-shirt written on the back under construction. We are in the process of sanctification. God is still working on us. Even the last day you're going to breathe out of this world. You breathe out to the last breath. All, you're going to always be working on something until Jesus returns. So remember, yes, God wants us to... Yes, God wants to follow men, but men of God are not perfect. Women of God are not perfect, but God has chosen them anyway. Sometimes you can have a man, a woman of God in your life. Someone, you are in a better position than them. It can be uh, socially, it can be uh, financially, it can be uh, in whatever case. But that does not mean that that anointing they carry cannot help you. And I want to say this because of what you notice I, I keep emphasizing on this because of what you being taught around. Oh, they can't teach me nothing. You can't bring someone we have never been. It's not true. These are, these are statements people are throwing out there, but it's not biblical. Look what Apostle Paul said in first, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 10. A sorrowful yet always rejoicing. A poor yet making many rich. Is having nothing yet possessing all things. Now, I want us to read it from an uh, 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 easy uh, translation. We seem to be sad, but really we are always uh, happy. We seem to be poor, but we make many people rich. We seem to have nothing, but really we have everything. Now, Apostle Paul is telling us here, listen, the anointing of God, because we remember I told you the anointing is never for you. The anointing for somebody else. You also, if you want to benefit, if God give given an anointing, you have to do what is required from the kingdom of God to benefit a particular anointing in your life. For instance, if you want to be prosperous, 
You have to be a giver. You have to do all sorts of things. If you have an, have an anointing or power, you have to fast, you have to pray. So you can have an anointing that makes you many rich. By yourself, you are broke. Why? Because you have an anointing, but you necessarily not engaging that anointing in terms of practical practicals, the things you're supposed to do. So what I want us to understand is this, people of God. Someone might not have, because listen, they might not have, they might not be rich, they can make you rich. What makes you rich is not them, it's the anointing. Someone cannot be smart, they might, might be uneducated, but they can give you wisdom. Why? Because the, the spirit they have within them is an ancient spirit. In the spirit of the age is the Holy Ghost. So you can have you can have someone who has no education, who have no training, but they can bless you and bring you to a place of significance. So what am I saying? God can send people to us, but what we receive from men and women of God is based on our perception. A man of God, a woman of God can be anointed, but what for that anointing to be received? So for that anointing to function, it's up to the people that that man or woman is sent to. You can, listen, you can be like, you can feel sometimes God called you, you say, God, Islam, I'm not anointed. No, you are, you are anointed, but you, you are sent to people who do not perceive you as anointed. Anointed. As a result, now, that anointing is not working for them. Because you receive from the anointing what you perceive in the anointing. Some people put it this way. The anointing you honor is the anointing you receive. Even Jesus, he could not bless the people who could not perceive him as a son of God. Look at this, Matthew chapter 13, verse 50. Matthew 13, verse 55 to 58. I'll read very quickly, I'm closing. Is this, this not the competent son? Not his mother called Mary, and his brother James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? When did these men get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except his own country and his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This is Jesus. Listen to this. This is Jesus. He came to the people. His own people, they start saying, oh, this Patrick, we know him. This is this, this is Sidonia's this husband. This is uh, we know him. Ah, oh, we know him. His mama said, what is he talking about? He's a man of God. Since when? You see, because of familiarity, because they knew Jesus, they said, this sister here, Mary, that's your brother, Joseph. Judah, look, how come this? Since when he became all that? He's talking to people about his anointed, anointed. We know him, he's... This table, who made this table? It's not Jesus. You see, they did not perceive Jesus. And the Bible said because of that, Jesus did not do any miracle there. Why was Jesus uh, limited? Was Jesus anointed? Believe me. He was, uh, he was limited because of unbelief, because of their perception of him. You can have an anointed man and woman in your midst. Dripping with oil, anointing like a honey. But you perceive him just like that. Is a result that that anointing is not profiting to you. It's not helping you. That anointing is not doing anything in your life. But when you read that scripture, it just breaks your heart. The same Jesus. This Matthew chapter 13. You go to Matthew chapter 14. He multiplied bread. Fed 5,000 people. Five loaves to bread. Two fishes. Five loaves of bread, two fish, five thousand people. I mean, without counting men and women, uh, women and children, five thousand people, five thousand men, five thousand men, without counting children and women. But when it came to the previous chapter, what did they say? I can't because of their perception. People got what am I saying? When God sends you a man of God, God sends you a woman of God, God sends you. A, 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 a leaders, whoever you believe you are under, follow, believe in the anointing. Be, when they speak, you say, I receive your word. And when you receive, take it as a word from God. Like Apostle Paul said, when we speak, we speak as the oracles of God. When you see Jesus, he said this, 
He said, if you give this man or woman of God, or this little one, a cup of water, Jesus will pay you. Why? Because he's the one who called them. Who's the one who sent them? So what now a device I will give to, to young men and women there? Oh, I'm late. Give me two minutes. I'm closing. What advice I will give to you? You know you are anointed. You know God called you. You know you, 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 you have the grace of God for your life. But people don't receive you. Listen. People just tolerate you. Listen. I love what uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Maddox said. Mike Maddox said, you have to go where you are celebrated and not where you are tolerated. Where people are tolerating you, you are just one of them. No! It, it, when you are called by God, that anointing has a purpose. So when people don't receive you, they don't honor your anointing, leave. Matthew chapter 10, 14. I'll read it for you. And whoever will not receive who receive you, no hear your word. When you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. And now when Jesus is telling us, listen, when people don't receive you, don't waste your time trying to change their mind. If they made up your mind to see a certain way, there is nothing you can do that will ever change their mind. The best you can do for yourself, remember people of God, if God called you, God anointed you, there are 8 billion people out there. God will have never put oil over your head if there is no one connected to our oil. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us God comforts us so we can comfort others. If God anoints you because someone needs anointing, if somebody does not honor your anointing, they don't treat you like you have anything, leave and go. And I'm closing with this. Apostle Paul said this to, uh, in the, to the, the leaders in Ephesus in Acts, Acts, uh, Acts chapter 20. 26 to 27. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I have no shame to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I read it in easy uh, translation. I'm closing with this. So I want to say this clearly to you today. If any of you have no belief in Jesus, it's not because of me. I have told you everything that God wants you to know. When I read this, I say, my God. This apostle first, he was leaving. He said to them, listen, if you don't believe by now, I've done my best. I preached to you the word. I've shown you the way, telling them, if you don't believe, it's not up to me. And a lot of men who are anointed, a lot of women who are, who are they, 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 they have grace over their lives. They are wasting their anointing, trying to change people who will never be changed, trying to reach out to people who will never honor them, just wasting their anointing while there are thousands out there who will celebrate just your presence. This reminds me of one of the prophets. I know him. I don't want to say his name. He was just here in Europe, just around the corner here, in, in Holland. I don't want to say his name. Probably some of you. He was in Holland here. Working in factories. A prophet of God. Working in factory. People just, you know, people treat him like, you know, sometimes church people. Ah. The man is struggling. He told his wife, we are living. We are European. Let's go to live in Canada. Oh, his wife said, we are going to Canada. They left in Canada. Now, if you watch, he came to minister for one someone in, in, in Australia last time. Very difficult. This man is in Canada. is one of the greatest voices, prophetic voice in our generation. Actually, today when I was preparing, I just wanted to make sure because I wanted to use an example to make sure he's still doing well. I went to his YouTube. I checked his website. My God, the guy has doubled. On his birthday, they gave him an airplane, a private jet. On his birthday, now here is the man who's struggling here, working in a factory here in Holland. People took him just like that. He went to Canada. People celebrate this. Do you want to mean? What am I trying to say? You are the same person, the same anointing. What have changed? People perceive the anointing, and the people perceive the anointing. They are the one who enjoy the anointing. 
When the Samaritan woman had an argument with Jesus, you are the son of God, you are a prophet. When he, when he was saying, oh, our forefathers drank from this and did Jacob, did, is, she had an argument with Jesus in John chapter 4. But when Jesus began to talk to her, you know what she said? I perceive that you are a prophet. When she, she changed her perception of Jesus, that was that when Jesus brought her to a destiny. People of God, God called you. This is a counsel. I'm giving advice. Someone is waiting for your anointing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is spirit. Your word is life. Father, we came to learn. We are learning. And we pray that you help us if we learn your word so we can grow from glory to glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for listening to this message. If you were blessed by what you just heard and wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that He died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life and I receive eternal life into my spirit and I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. If you just said this prayer, please reach out to us at kli.org.au or any of our social media platforms. God bless you.